question, how many kinds of Islam are there? Well, you see, you have a superficial division in several tendencies like uh, Shiism and Sunnism. But uh, ultimately, there's only one Islam. And so there are differences about uh, dots and commas. But the belief that Muhammad was the prophet, that the Quran is the word of God, that is common to them all. And so as um, the Turkish president uh, Recep Tayyip Erdogan has said, there is only one Islam. It is an insult. It is, a, it is a, an insulting imposition of Western values to uh, pretend that there are different kinds of Islam and that one kind of Islam should be promoted over other kinds. So there really is only one Islam. Of course, uh, there are people whose behavior, whose writings um, give occasion to characterizations like extremist and moderate. That is true. But if you look more closely, those are not different kinds of Islam. There is an important analytical difference, and it's very important to uh, insist on this difference in order to understand the question correctly. Namely, the difference is not between extremist and moderate Muslims, no, it is between a strict interpretation of Islam and a weak version of Islam, where Islam is, is espoused in name, where lip service is paid to Islam, but in fact, many non-Islamic values are brought in. You see, uh, why are people... Uh, for example, why are people enthusiastic about music? You see, as the earlier speaker correctly said, uh, music is not Islamic. Now, just, just recently, the Taliban in, in Afghanistan have again uh, murdered or otherwise terrorized several musicians. And so uh, music is un-Islamic uh, because the prophet couldn't stand music. This probably had to do with his own neurological disorder that explains the hallucinations, which he interpreted as hearing the voice of God. Now, of course, that's, that's, that's a deduction that we can make from Islamic scripture. None of us was present there, so this is a hypothesis. But at any rate, the prophet disapproved of music. And so, because Islam consists essentially in imitation of the Prophet, therefore the Taliban or the Ayatollahs in Iran, all serious Muslims disapprove of music. Music is intrinsically un-Islamic. Now, what to do with all these moderates who do practice music? And you even have specific types of of Islamic music or Sufi music like Kawali, like Sema, and um, uh, so they are forms of compromise between Islam and normal human nature is naturally inclined to music, to enjoy music, to make music. And so some people born in a Muslim background still have that normal human tendency to music. So those people may, under social pressure, pay lots of emphatic lip service to Islam, but what they are actually doing is un-Islamic and remains un-Islamic. And so if I say music is un-Islamic, then of course some soft brain will come in between and say, oh, but I have a neighbor and he's a great singer and he's a fervent Muslim. Well, you see, he misunderstands. Okay, on the one hand, he may call himself a Muslim. On the other hand, to the extent that he enjoys music, he's not a Muslim, he's just a human being. So that distinction should always be carefully made. You see, this behavior, like, for instance, music, like tolerance, of other religions, for example, which indeed you do find among many Indian Muslims. You see, they 
can perfectly tolerate having a giant neighbor or a sick neighbor or whatever. Um, that is just a human tendency. That's not Islamic. And indeed, in Islam, you have always movements to promote real Islam, to fight these, these soft, these humanistic tendencies. Like um, in, his, in, in India, you have the Tablighi movement. You see, as you may remember, uh, among Hindus, there was the uh, reform movement Arya Samaj, which was very active in what it called Shudhi, or purification, which meant a reconversion of converts to Islam back to Hinduism, right? So, and this was possible because many Muslims were only very superficially Islamized and had retained many of the Hindu customs of their ancestors. And therefore, for them, it was not a big step to reconvert to Hinduism. So in order to combat this tendency, Muslims said, well, you see, we have to Islamize the Muslims. We have to make the, the nominal Muslims, the Muslims in name only, more conscious of real Islam. You see, we have to, we have to uh, not drown them, but immerse them in real Islam and make them real intolerant Muslims. So that's the Tablighi movement. Yeah, a recent uh, leader of that was uh, Maulana Wahiduddin Khan, whom I regret to say was very feted by Hindu twelve leaders. You see, thinking that, oh, if they could humor him and appease him, he would bring lots of Muslims, not into Hinduism, but at least into some, some, some arrangement with the Hindu movement. Um, so that, that's, that's often, you see, this idea that uh, soft-brained Hindus have, that if you are only nice enough to Muslims, then they will be nice to you. And so that's, uh, that's only true if you deal with Muslims who are not really Muslims, who have not really been immersed in Islam. But so real Islam is intolerant. It's intolerant to music. Uh, it's intolerant to gestures towards the kafirs, the unbelievers, and so on. There is only one uh, real Islam. Now, you can compare the role of real Islam in the life of ordinary Muslims to um, a box that is being passed on in a family from generation to generation. This box contains a poison. Now, the first generation, like let's say the first converts, who only convert under duress, under social pressure, or even under physical uh, force, um, they simply convert to Islam without actually believing in it. Then their children go to the madrasas and so on. And so after a few generations, they're fully Muslim. They have completely forgotten about their non-Muslim origins. But you see, they're not really fanatical yet. But you see, this box, which is Islamic doctrine, is passed on from generation to generation. Then one day, some... You know, usually a teenage uh, boy uh, gets enthusiastic. You know, he, he gets religion and he opens the box and he sees what Islam really stands for. And he becomes enthusiastic for this real Islam. And so then he joins the Taliban or Boko Haram or Al-Shabaab or the Islamic State. And then you get real Islam in action. Then you get terrorism and so on. Um, so this is not to say that there are no moderate Muslims only. They are only moderate because they're to the extent that they're not Muslims. But you see, in human nature, all these strange combinations exist. So among Muslims too. Uh, so theologically, there is really no problem. Islam is Islam, and it's a very straightforward subject. You see, I myself have essentially lost interest in Islam maybe 20 years ago, simply because it's such a simple topic. You see, after a fairly short while, you have simply understood. And by the way, I am very fortunate, you know, to see many young people like the, the, 
the, the, the former speaker who have delved into the subject of Islam and who are now um, now uh, translating this, this information about Islam for the present generation. So the, the information about Islam is available, remains available, becomes ever better available. There are websites specialized in discussing the different problems with Islam. But so ultimately, I for myself have decided, well, essentially everything about Islam has been said. Um, now we me merely have to see what policies follow from this. And so that is more a human problem. You see, um, you know, how, how do you tell Muslims this? I mean, you shouldn't throw them all into the Indian Ocean, of course. I don't think anybody in his right mind is saying that. Uh, but what should you do, you see? Should you prohibit Islam from being taught in school, for example? You see, that's, again, a very far-reaching uh, step to take. And some people do advocate that. Uh, should you rather, as I tend to say, uh, emphasize scientific education, teaching the scientific temper, not only, you know, devoted to, to ridiculous superstitions, but really to, to the hot issues like Islam and show the contrast uh, between what Muslims believe and what may really have happened. You see, Muhammad did not hear the voice of God. There is nothing in the Quran that shows it to be a prophetic book dictated by some supernatural being. No, it's entirely the uh, product of a seventh century Arab businessman. There is absolutely nothing in the Quran that goes against this. So you see, this should widely be taught. So the policy of appeasement of Islam, that is what should stop. If you treat them as normal human beings, and if you treat Islam as one of the very many doctrines that human beings have thought up, then already the, the most fundamental step uh, has been made. So otherwise, you see, of course, Islamic terrorism, Islamic riots, create certain practical problems, for that you have a security apparatus. And so let them do their work. That's not my job. But the ideological job has far more importance long term. You see, if you do like, like for instance, the Americans after 9-11, you know, you deploy lots of military power. Well, that, that has a short term result can't deny that it has had some results. Like initially, they beat back the Taliban in Afghanistan, initially. But then they did nothing of the necessary ideological work, not as propaganda among Muslims, but especially not in their own decision centers. And so all the successive American presidents and their entourage, they have consistently cultivated misinformation about Islam. Always saying, oh, Islam is a great religion, but the Muslims are great fools. The Muslims have misunderstood the prophet and so on. That's all nonsense. You see, if they misunderstand the prophet, well, that's a good thing. You see, if they take the prophet seriously and follow his example, just like the, the prophet destroyed all the statues in the Kaaba when he transform this pagan place of pilgrimage into an Islamic place of pilgrimage. That way, all the Muslim conquerors, Aurangzeb and so on, Mahmoud Ghaznavi and so on, they have destroyed Hindu temples. Or the Taliban have destroyed the Buddhas of Bamiyan and so on. That's because they take the example of the Prophet serious. So that's the real problem. If policymakers in America or indeed in India had understood that, they would have made big strides towards solving the problem. That, unfortunately, has not happened, but that's what, uh, what I keep working on. Right. Uh, so essentially, uh, to, to quickly answer your question, there are moderates within the Muslim world, but that is to the extent that they are not, um, not Muslims. Uh, you can, well, yeah, one final comparison. The effect of alcohol on people, particularly on driving. 
You see, some people, they can drink themselves totally drunk and then take their car and drive home safely. Somehow they know how to pull it off. Other people, by contrast, they may have drunk very little or they may have drunk nothing at all. No matter what you do, they are a danger on the road. That's very but well said. But Dr. between Ray. these two extremes, for most people, obviously, alcohol has a negative effect on your driving capacity. So similarly, the Islamic doctrine has a negative, a fanaticizing uh, effect on your attitude towards other human beings. So thanks for your attention.